Let me explain, <clears throat> explain what this means. First, let me pass this around for you, party few who show up. Um, put your name on there. I think what I've been adding is like five points. Um, so, where the original syllabus has the revised original syllabus has for November 2nd, uh, November 2nd, 4th, and 7th. The second was the reading poetry, all the introductory kind of stuff, but it had two poems at the end, one of which we kind of discussed, we're going to go over it again today, um, to the virgins to make much of time, and to his coy mistress, and then the things that are assigned for the original date, November 4th, two poems offered to a book and a valediction for being morning. And then for the seventh, um, one, two, three, four, five poems. We're going to try to do all of those today. And then what was on for the November 9th and 11th, we're going to do on Wednesday. Those are Ode on a Grecian Urn, Ode to the West Wind, Acquainted with the Night, Road Not Taken, and Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. And then what was on for the 14th and 16th, we're going to do this Friday. That includes Scarborough Fair, and on your syllabus is a link to, um, I think just the lyrics, not a sound file, of Simon Scar um, Simon, Scarborough. Simon and Garfunkel's version of Scarborough Fair, Kubicon, Pied Beauty, Toronto's been long in city pent. We're not going to have class next week because nobody's going to show up anyways. Um, if the last couple weeks, I mean, this is two to three times normal what I've been getting at this time slot. Um, so we're just not going to meet on Monday. The following Monday are the two days, the 18th and the 21st, for Monday the 28th. Those are My Heart Leaps Up, The World Is Too Much With Us, She Walks in Beauty, Dog's Death, which we've already discussed. We might go over it a little bit more. Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night, Death Be Not Proud and Batter My Heart. And then the last day of class, Wednesday the 30th, the last two days that were in the original syllabus. So um, let's go back to to the virgins to make much of time on page 645. <clears throat> um, for the purposes of quiz and final exam, final exam is only everything from poetry forward, except for extra credit. Extra credit can go all the way back, okay? Um, the, as with the previous exams, terms in bold. Okay, can show up. They can also show up on quizzes. We will have probably at least three more quizzes. Remember, the drama exam is due tonight. Um, I may put up a quiz tonight over some of the terms and maybe the, it won't be due till Wednesday or Friday. Um, and maybe the poems that we'll do through today. Okay, so 6.45, right, yeah, 6.45. <clears throat> Carpe diem again, <clears throat> Latin phrase, That means seize the day. <clears throat> Essentially, it's a genre of poetry or a belief system that, you know, you never know when your end's going to come. I was literally five minutes ago, read, read an article. Uh, I don't know if you've heard or read a little thing. University of Virginia 
Last night, there was a shooter. Shooter's still at large, three people dead. At the end of term, people are going a little crazy, a little stressed, okay? You never know. So, Robert Herrick, to the virgins to make much of time. Um, I know we went over this. I'm just trying to think, is there? Yeah, a couple, let me do it again quickly. Gabby Rosebud's why he may, old time is still a flying, and this same flower that smiles today, <coughs> tomorrow will be dying. Every carpe diem idea is about the passage of time, and it's about the swift passage of time, okay? It might seem like you've got the rest of your life, but you may not. That's why, you know, Rosebud's, that's the tightly wound, hasn't even started to open. Today, gather those rosebuds. Why? Because tomorrow, the flower that smiles today, and the smile means it's starting to open, tomorrow, petals are falling off. All right? Second stanza. The glorious lamp of heaven, the sun, the higher he's getting, the sooner will his race be run, and nearer he's to setting. So, east, west, once the sun reaches the PM, the prime meridian, okay, essentially what's happening? Once it reaches this point, it's setting, right? Doesn't matter whether it sets like this or sets like this. Dante, in his Divine Comedy, begins the long, long poem with talking about midway through this life's journey, he found himself in a wood. It's all a vision, okay? Well, midway through this life's journey is referring to, and, and when he wrote it, he was this age, is referring to being 35 years old. Why? Because the Old Testament says the life of man is three score and 10 years. And if you're lucky, four score. So three score and 10, 70. If you're lucky, 80. Half of 70 is 35, okay? Glorious lamp of heaven, the higher he's a getting, the sooner will his race be run, and nearer he's to settings. You guys are all in your 20s. If, as you start getting older, he's saying, that time's gonna run more quickly. That age is best, which is the first, when youth and blood are warmer. But being spent, the worst and worst times still succeed the former. He's playing on this Renaissance notion, late medieval, early modern notion, that when you're young, your blood is like this water or like this fluid. Very um, fluid. As you get older, change the image of blood. Your blood is like this in the sense that if you fry up bacon or meat or something and you take the meat out, what's left in the pan? Grease. Okay? And when it's really hot, you can do this and do what? The grease will slosh back and forth. What happens if you let it sit 30 minutes? It congeals. It hardens. The Renaissance notion was our blood is the same has the same kind of viscosity, okay? When we're young, it's like this, okay? When you're my age, it's like hardening fat, right? What's the implication? We're not moving as well. We can't do things we used to do. So being spent, that is, youth and blood, once they're used up, the worse in worst times, still, and still there means always, continuously, what succeeds the former. So, kind of once you get past this age, every day is what? It's going downhill. Tomorrow will be worse than today. The day after tomorrow will be worse than tomorrow. The day after that will be worse than then. What's the then imply? What kind of an adverb is then? It's time. It's always of time. Then, 
Therefore, be not coy. What's it mean to be coy? What kind of people, and this may be an unfair question because you may have literally never heard the word before. It's not used very much anymore. What kind of people is coy usually applied to? Women. Usually. Again, in 2022, it is not used very much. 30 years ago, you would have heard it more. 50 years ago, you would have heard a lot. 100 years ago, it was used regularly. But it's one of those words that's kind of dropped out of usage. So, take a wild guess. If it generally, in the past, was applied more to women, what's it mean? Like look, status thing? No, look, look at what he says. Then be not coy, but use your time. And while you may, go marry. And remember, the other day, when I wrote the word marry down, I said it could also imply marry. Go happy. Doesn't necessarily mean put a ring on it. All right? You mean like naive? Like don't be, or be naive and not the time you have left? Kind of. Kind of like naive. But it's more intentionally naive. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna to speak to the guys, and maybe I'm entirely wrong. Maybe this is just me. Back when you know, before I was married, what was one thing you don't like doing when you were just at the beginning of a relationship with someone, primarily a woman? Talking about the future. Okay, what else? What's one of the things you hate about quote unquote dating? It's a game, right? There are games involved. What's part of the danger of the game? Am I playing it right? Am I, am I missing the cues? Is she missing the cues? Okay. That's what the movie Hitch, if you've ever seen it, if you haven't watched it, it's, it's what the movie Hitch is entirely about. It's about a guy who helps other guys find the woman of their dreams or marry the woman of their dreams, not just about hookups kind of a thing. And it's about, man, you need to learn to read, you know, the territory, read the room, understand what's going on. Be not coy means don't play hard to get. She's being, another word that we don't use anymore. I, I shouldn't even use it, but I'm going to. That's a cue. Don't be coquettish. Okay? And it's a word that kind of means she's out there fishing just like he is. Okay? Fishing, angling, is a metaphor that's been used in the past for trying to find a mate. So what do you do? You throw your bait out. What's the bait always attached to? A hook. Okay? What is, when you go fishing, what does bait often have also attached to it? Or what does the hook have attached to it? What's the purpose of the bait? It's to draw attention, right? If you do fly fishing, what's the hook have? It's got a fly, right? And it looks like something in particular. So, be not coy. Don't be hard to get. Don't say, oh, I'm not going to do this until blah, blah, blah. But use your time. Notice, use it. Don't let time use you. Why? And while ye may, go marry. Now, I do think the surface literal meaning is Go get married. When? What's that, you know, use your time. When you're young, when you're attractive, when you're good looking, when the bait is still good. Why? 
for having lost but once your prime. What's the prime? It's not virginity. Not necessarily. Might be. Youth. Youth. Having lost but once your prime, your youthfulness, what? You may forever tarry. What does it mean to tarry? Wait. Another way of putting carpe diem. Five word phrase. Use it or lose it. If you don't use your youth, your sex appeal, you might lose it. Not in the sense of rape or anything like that, but you might lose it in the sense of you won't have it when? When you're no longer in your prime. And therefore, it won't get used. Okay? Now look to the next Carpe Diem poem. Andrew Marvell. Next page. Okay? I'll warn you right now, this poem has an absolutely disgusting image. I mean, it should make you go, <laughs> literally should make you want to hurl. So, it begins with a subjunctive. That is, a condition contrary to fact. Had we but world enough in time, this coyness, there's that word coy again, this coyness lady were no crime. We would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long love day. Thou by the Indian Ganges side shouldst rubies find. I by the tide of umber would complain. Okay, so let me stop there. And by the way, it's written in three stanzas. So, had we but world enough and time, this coyness lady were no crime. Notice the condition. If we had all the time in the world, then your playing hard to get wouldn't be an issue. Why not? If we had infinity, then we could sit and play stupid games for eternity. What's the problem? We don't have that time. And so when he says, we would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long love day. How many of you remember, maybe again, maybe it's just me. How many of you remember being a little kid, middle of August, doing something with a friend and just saying, what do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? Or with a sibling or something. Because you couldn't decide what, and you literally waste an entire day not doing anything. That's what he's talking about. Okay? He says, we can sit down and think what we're going to do. You can sit by the Indian Ganges, the Ganges River of India, and would find rubies. And I would sit by the tide of Umber, this, the Umber River, which is in northeastern England, and I would complain. Complain doesn't mean he's just going to sit there and moan and grab a bitch about how horrible his life is. Complain means write little love poems about my unrequited love, okay? So he gives us another image. I would love you 10 years before the flood. That's Noah's flood. Well, when's Noah's flood? It's like in the ninth or 10th chapter of the book of Genesis. It's like close to the beginning of the world, okay? So 10 years before that, I would love you. And you should, if you please, again, had we world enough in time, you would refuse till the conversion of the Jews. Well, when is the conversion of the Jews? According to some Protestant theology. Book of Revelation, end of days, the end of the world. So from 10 years before Noah's flood to the end of the world, I would, you know, try to seduce you and you would refuse me if we had world enough in time. My vegetable love should grow vaster than empires and more slow. What in the hell does he mean by vegetable love? How do vegetables grow? Slowly. 
very, that's all he means by it. Okay? A hundred years, again, if we had world enough in time, he says, I would spend a hundred years to do what? A hundred years to go should go to praise your eyes and forehead. Okay? So he's going to start quantifying. What else? 200 to adore each breast. So he starts up here and he starts moving down. 200 years to adore each breast, but 30,000 to the rest. Again, where's he started? Eyes and forehead, breasts, 30,000 a little bit farther down. An age at least to every part. And the last age, oh, isn't that sweet, should show your heart. For lady, you deserve this state. Nor would I love at lower rate. Rate. It's like economic language. You're worth 8.9 APR at least. Okay. But at my back, I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near. Why is Time's chariot at his back? It's trying to catch up. Have you ever seen an image of death as the grim, grim reaper? Okay, what's he doing? He's coming up behind people and taking out their legs. He's not coming facing, all right? But at my back, I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near. And yonder, all before us, lie deserts of vast eternity. How often have you ever thought, if you've ever thought of eternity, <coughs> as being like Death Valley, the Mojave Desert, the Sahara? Most people... When they think of eternity, if they think of eternity at all, if they're thinking of it as heaven, it's what? It's a garden. It's beautiful. It's a palace. It's a place where there's light, where there's life, and there's greenery, and it's lush. Not, you know, scalding, burning hot desert sand. So, light all before us like deserts of vast eternity. Thy beauty shall no more be found, nor in thy marble vault shall sound my echoing song. When is that? In the future. Because we don't have world enough in time, what is going to be the future, ultimately, of each and every one of us? Death. And he says, and when you are in your marble vault, that is your mausoleum, I'm not going to be singing love songs to you. Why? Because I'll be dead too. No, no, no. Then, in the future, here's the disgusting image. Worms shall try that long preserved virginity. Try means what? Test. Prove. Worms will go in and out of what you didn't let me go in and out of. That's why I said it's disgusting. In your quaint honor turn to dust and into ashes all my lust. Quaint, quaint means fine, fastidious, nitpicky if you want, okay? Kind of interesting. I don't think you have a footnote. Nope, you don't, because he's chicken. <laughs> that word quaint, is related to the Middle English quainta, which in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, he uses that word a few times, and it's always in the connection of 
Somebody grabbing somebody else by the quinta, the fine fastidious thing. Okay. Any guesses as to what modern English word derives from that? I saw. I see two grins. Look at the sil uh, the consonants. Ka, n, t. Yeah, that's the word that comes from that. So he's saying that's honor. And what turn happens to his lust? It turns into ash. Well, lust is an immaterial thing, so how can it burn? Well, he's talking about something else. The graves are fine and private place, but none, I think, do there embrace. Now, Marvel, Marvell, is probably punning there on a poem by John Donne, an author we're going to read later, a little bit later, maybe even today. Um, yes, we are today. Because John Donne has a poem called The Relic. And it's about two bodies discovered in a grave. Again, think Hamlet. You dig up a grave to put a new body in. It's about two bodies discovered in a grave and the the Bodies are bound together, not like prisoners. They're bound together by a lock of hair, if I remember correctly, by the wrists. And it, that's taken to be a relic, like some something with power because of the love of these two people. This speaker is saying, you know, the grave's, the grave's fine. And it's private. <laughs> you can do what you want when you're dead. But none, I think, do their embrace. He's saying... When you're dead, you're dead. Now, therefore. So, had we but world enough in time, then in the future, so the one is implying all of eternity, the other is saying just the future, and then we go to now. It's the carpe diem, it's the present. Now, therefore, while the youth, the youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning dew. Well, what happens to morning dew? What happens when the sun comes up? It evaporates. It disappears. So, the youthful hue, the glow of your complexion, is going to what? Evaporate. And while thy willing soul transpires at every pore with instant fires. In other words, you, the speaker is saying to the person listening, you want me. I know you want me. And Marvel didn't know anything about pheromones, you know. Those hormones that give off scent, supposedly. Okay. Now, let us sport us while we may. Let's have fun. And now, like amorous birds of prey, rather at once our time devour than languish in his slow chapped power. What the hell is he talking about with birds of prey? Kites, falcons, eagles, kestrels. He's playing on the Renaissance idea. I don't know if this is true or not. I've never actually looked it up in the book of ornithology. That birds of prey mate by flying high up in the air, and then the male mounts the female, and they just drop. They're not flapping their wings. They're just dropping. And she's going, hurry, 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 before they splat. They're doing what? Outrunning time. Okay? That's the language in his slow chapped power. Slow chapped is slow chewing. Time slowly grinds down everything. So, I'm throwing the, the cell in. Let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball. That is, let the two get so entwined that we can't be separated. And tear our pleasures with rough strife through the iron gates of life. 
He's not talking S&M or bondage or anything weird. He's saying, let's so unite ourselves that we do what? We wear out time. Thus, though we cannot make our sun stand still, biblical illusion, Joshua, the city of Ai, God prayed, God stopped the sun. Yet we will make him run. That is, we're going to give the son, to use the phrase, a run for his money. We're going to make the son work hard. Why? Because the son is just the image of time. We're going to outrun the son. Well, how can you do that? Literally, you can't. Okay? But what can you do Kind of outrun the sun to outlast time. Is this going to go to the phrase like time flies and you're going to run? Yes, very much so. Okay. And if you're having fun, what can you com what can you produce that outlives you? Kids. Children. We're going to see a couple poems by Shakespeare that are going to emphasize that. Children, we die. Children go on. They die, their children go on, etc., etc. Okay. Now go to the author to her book, 692. This is Anne Bradstreet. Briefly mentioned it the other day. We're talking about controlling metaphors and extended metaphors. 1678. The little background to this poem is Bradstreet had written a book of poetry, handwritten, okay? Her brother-in-law thought it was great, thought it should be published. She didn't think so. He stole it, went to England, published it. It was immediately hailed as great poetry. He brought it back to the United States, at that point to the colonies. He brought it back to the colonies and it got republished here, okay? This is her response to her book of poetry being published, okay? This is what she, if I remember this, the version correctly, this is what she then has published as part of the first American edition of her book of poetry, okay? She was called, and I think there's an allusion somewhere in here. She was called the Tenth Muse. There are nine, nine, nine muses in Greek mythology. Each one is an inspirer of a certain kind of writing. And the implication is, she's the new muse, a, a new inspirer. Thou ill-formed offspring of my feeble brain, who after birth didst by my side remain, till snatched from thence by friends less wise than true, who thee abroad exposed to public view, made thee in rags, halting to the press to trudge, where errors were not lessened, all may judge. So let's stop there. Thou ill-formed offspring of my feeble brain, deformed children, why? Because I'm not intellectually all that capable. Not literally. Okay, these are all just metaphors. Till snatched from thence. Why? Because the children stayed by her side. Till snatched from thence by thin friends, less wise than true. The friend's brother-in-law was true or were true because they thought this is great poetry. That is, they were true, loyal to her. But they weren't wise because she's going to imply there's problems with the verse. She needs to fix it. Who the abroad exposed to public view. Okay. But again, the speaker is saying, my children are ill-formed. Made thee in rags, halting to the press to trudge. Okay. Rags, there are a couple of different meanings. Probably the one, the kind of paper that's being referred to. Not wood cellulose paper, but 
paper made of cotton. Original paper was made of cotton. It was made of cotton and linen and things like that. Other than the um, vellum, which is made from sheep or lambskin. Okay. Made the end rags, halting to the press to trudge, where errors were not lessened, all may judge. Okay. The speaker is suggesting the children slash poems weren't properly dressed, meaning I didn't have an opportunity to revise, to correct problems. And also the comment where errors were not lessened, all may judge. Whoever typeset, composed, okay, the first printed version of her poetry introduced lots of errors. And that's probably because, I'm assuming here, the version or the manuscript book that the poetry was put into type from had lots of corrections. And maybe the printer couldn't read clearly some of those corrections. So one of the things that happens in the early days of printing is errors creep in. And then they get printed and printed and printed again. Uh, I've been rereading C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy. And I've noticed in the second two books of the trilogy, all kinds of errors, typographical errors, that came in in the early, now, in the late 20th century, 1990s, that are not in earlier versions of the book I have, because I've compared them. So she goes on. At thy return, that is, when she got the printed copy of her poems, my blushing was not small. She was embarrassed. My rambling brat in print should mother call, because it says, title page, in Bread Street. I cast thee by as one unfit for light, thy visage was so irksome in my sight. I put the book away. Now, I think the book there is two possible meanings. Or the I cast thee by as one and fit for light. I think that can refer to both the manuscript book that she had handwritten all of her poems in. She didn't think it was fit for light, so she kind of stuck it in a drawer. It could also refer to the first printed copy she received. She also stuck in a drawer because it had lots of problems. But yet, being mine own, at length affection would thy, blish, thy blemishes amend, if so, I could. But because you were mine, I thought maybe I could fix you. I washed thy face, but more defects I saw, and rubbing off a spot still made a flaw. How many of you have ever taken an exam where you've had to do a bunch of writing. With me, it was always math. Where you have some long equation or something, and I'm making, I'm writing, and I realize I made a mistake, and I go through and erase, and then I realize again I made a mistake, and I go, and you erase a hole in the paper. That's what she's talking about, okay? She thought she could fix it, but in trying to scrub out the error, she made a new flaw. I stretch thy, thy joints to make thee even feet. Remember the other day we talked about feet are accented, unaccented syllables? And you have different kinds of feet. Those are the things I said you didn't have to memorize in that section, anapestum, trochae, and all those kinds of things. What she's saying is there were lines where she had only nine syllables. Maybe she wanted 10. So she, she stretched the joints to make 10 syllables in each line. Yet still thou runst more hobbling than is meat. That is, she couldn't get it down perfectly. Still, some of her lines are deficient or uh, what's called hypermetric. More feet, more syllables than is required. In better dress to trim thee was my mind. I wanted to 
make you look better for public consumption, so to speak. Okay? But not save homespun cloth in the house, I find. And what Bradstreet is suggesting there, the homespun cloth, is the material her poems were about. The matter her poems were about. Homespun cloth is referring to her poetry largely about her husband, her children, her home, her family. The things that were nearest and dearest to her. Not great battles, great personages, great people, etc. In this array that is Dressed as I have given you, fixed as I have fixed you. Mongst vulgars mayst thou roam. So, she's corrected the errors as best she could. And now you can go out among vulgar, that is, everybody else, people. In critics' hands, beware thou dost not come. Don't fall into the hands of a literary critic. And take thy way where thou where yet thou art not known. That kind of implies um, go away from Massachusetts. And Bradstreet lived in Massachusetts. Go go where people don't know who we are. If for thy father ask they thou hadst none. Why? Because the poems are inspired up here. And for thy mother, she, alas, is poor, which caused her thus to send thee out of door. And those last two lines kind of imply, once she receives a copy of the printed poems, and she takes kind of ownership of it, says, yes, these are mine, and then desires to revise, edit, correct them, republishes them, at that point, she's doing it because they need the money. She has another poem about when her house burned down. It could be, you know, that's why they need the money. Um, go from there to Valediction Forbidding Morning on page 704. Don't think we'll get through all of these today. 704, this is a poem by John Dunn, author I mentioned a moment ago. Dunn was, a, Dunn was one of the most celebrated writers of his day, and his day was when Shakespeare was alive, okay? Uh, everybody wanted copies of Dunn's poetry. Dunn served as a soldier. He fought against the Spanish. Um, he had a brother and other relatives who died in the anti-Catholic hate of Elizabethan England. His family was very old Catholic. Dunn himself left the Catholic Church, became Anglican, eventually becoming an Anglican priest and what is called the Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral. That is, he ran the greatest cathedral in London. Okay? This is the poem that he wrote probably shortly before he took holy orders. He became a priest in 1615. Called a valediction forbidding mourning. What is a valediction? In high school, you probably have, well, if you're anything like my kids, graduating classes, you had 15 or 20 or 30 valedictorians. What does a valedictorian do? They give a speech, that's it. Valedictum. It is a goodbye saying. It's all it is. This is a valediction forbidding mourning. Dunn wrote three valedictions. Okay. Isaac Walton, Dunn's first biography, biographer, excuse me, told us, or in his, in his biography, he said that Dunn wrote this poem for his wife just before he had to leave for a trip to Europe, okay? She didn't want him to go. 
she was pregnant. She had a premonition that something was going to happen to the pregnancy. Okay. And from what we know, biographically, it did. While Dunn was in Europe, traveling with his employer, she delivered a stillborn child. She had 12 children in how many years? 1601, 12 years, 12 children in 16 years. Five of them, if I remember correctly, were stillborn or died in infancy, all right? So, a valediction forbidding mourning. As virtuous men pass mildly away and whisper to their souls to go, while some of their said friends do say, the breath goes now, and some say no, so let us melt and make no noise, no tear floods nor sigh tempest move, for profanation of our joys to tell the laity our move. So, Dunn's introduced a couple of ideas here. How do virtuous men die? mildly that means silently they don't go kicking and screaming they don't rail against god we're going to read a poem by dylan thomas in a few days called um do not go gentle into that good night and it's about railing railing against the dying of the light here virtuous men silently go while some of their said friends do say the breath goes now and some say no, they go so silently that the people sitting around the deathbed can't tell when the person has died. Okay? So let us melt. Let us dissolve from each other and make no noise. That is, don't cry. Don't make loud sighs when I leave. Why? It would be a profanation of our joys to tell the laity our love. This is an important image in Dunn. He loves to imply that lovers, love is like a, a religious love. Okay? So the only people who, there, who are the initiates into that love are the two lovers. Everybody else is a layman. Okay? The initiate is like the clergy. Priest, minister, preacher, etc., etc. Everybody else, the people sitting in the pews. So, he then gives us another image. Moving of the earth brings harms and fears, men reckon what it did and meant. But trepidation of the spheres, though greater far, is innocent. What's moving of the earth? We don't have them very often in Tennessee, but we do every now and then. Earthquakes, okay? An earthquake happens, and, and we still see this today. If there's a big, massive earthquake somewhere, you will see in the press, at some point, there will be a, a letter or an uh, article, where's God? Why does God allow such things to happen and kill, you know, hundreds and thousands of people? So that's one image. Moving over the earth brings harms and fears. Men reckon what it did and meant. Why did it happen? Trepidation of the spheres. Here's the earth. Okay. And then you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Spheres. So think of the earth as a ball. And around it are nine concentric spheres. This is the old conception of the universe. It's called the Ptolemaic conception of the universe after a Greek guy named Ptolemy. Outside this last sphere is what's called the Empyrean. That's where God dwells. Okay? This is the basis for astrology. Because each one of the spheres out here moves. And the movement of those spheres from the outermost to the innermost affects each inner sphere. So this movement of this of the ninth sphere affects the eighth one, which affects the seventh one, which all the way down to us, which is why if you're born under the planet, pick your planet, it has an emphasis on your life. It has an influence on your life, okay? 
So trepidation of the fears, Dunn says, though greater far, greater than earthquakes, is innocent. Why? Because this poem was written in 1611. What do I mean? In 1610, Galilei Galileo published his findings about the sun and the earth and the movements of each based upon Copernicus and Tycho Brahe. And what Galileo proved is the earth is not the center of the solar system. And the sun isn't the center of the universe. Proof we revolve around the sun, not the sun revolves around us. And that we and the sun are both moving. In other words, Galileo proved this whole conception of the universe is false. That's why Dunn can write, movement of the spheres is innocent. Dull sublunary lovers love whose soul is sense cannot admit absence because it doth remove those things which elemented it. Sublunary. So here's the earth. Here's the orbit of the moon. According to this idea, okay, the Ptolemaic conception, everything from the orbit of the moon down to earth is changeable or mutable. or impermanent. So, dull sublunary lovers love, lovers whose love is beneath the orbit of the moon, in other words, can't admit absence. Why? Because absence removes the things which made up that love. What are the things which make up that love? If absence removes something, what does it remove? The presence, right? The presence of the other person. In other words, the other person's body. And it's the other person's body that makes the lover love. Correct answer to why do you love me is never because you have a great body. Whether it's the male asking or the female asking. We by a love so much refined that ourselves know not what it is, enter assured of the mind, care less, eyes, lips, and hands to miss. In other words, the speaker is saying to the beloved, our love has nothing to do with physical sensation. No, our love, next stanza, our two souls, therefore, which are one, why? The speaker is probably telling us we're married and the two shall become one. Our two souls, therefore, which are one, though I must go, endure not yet a breach, but an expansion. Let gold to airy thinness beat. Okay? Gold is what kind of metal? It's soft. It's malleable. You can beat, beat, beat gold until you can, literally, you can use it for a window. You can see through it. It'll be gold-tinged, okay? But it's not brittle. It doesn't break, okay? So he says, our two souls will expand. Oh, okay, so maybe they are two. And he gives us a new image. They're like stiff twin legs of a compass. 855, we'll stop there. I'll use the uh, compass image on Wednesday. So for Wednesday, the 16th, do the poems that are assigned for the 9th and 11th. And we'll try to get caught up. All right, have a good day.